Well, anyway, we're a few minutes late, but welcome to the operator's view on the certified OpenStack administrator exam. Quiz, who's passed or who's taken the certified OpenStack exam? No one. OK, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> you, I didn't see you. <laughs> OK, well, let me introduce um, the panelist. Um, something's wrong with my slides. OK, it's working. Anyway, um, I want to introduce the panel. But myself, my name is Susan Wu. I'm the director of technical marketing uh, at Mitakura. Mitakura is actually a global startup. We have about 50 people with locations in Tokyo, Barcelona, right here in Barcelona, San Francisco. We provide network virtualization overlay. Um, we're the uh, plugin for OpenStack Neutron. We are also the top contributor to OpenStack uh, Neutron core, and we're also the founder of the um, Courier Container Project. So let me introduce the panelists. Um, it's not in any particular order. I have Samir Ibradik. He's the head of systems and infrastructure at Medakura. Samir. Uh, Robert Sarmer. Uh, Robert's the founding partner and cloud advisor for Cumulus Technologies, Cumulus with a K. Uh, Ron Terry. Ron is the training architect for SUSE and has done a lot of work uh, with the Certified Open Stack Administrator exam. What is this thing, anyway, and why are we here? Um, so a number of us um, volunteered to work on this Open Stack Administrator exam, where we actually define the job task. And a number of us wrote items on the exam, actually. So we, we have some tips. Um, so just very quickly, the definition of the OpenSec administrator is that you have six months of hands-on experience. And the exam covers a lot of areas, but the core OpenSec projects like compute, storage, networking, com um, and, and, and things like that. Um, and um, when you're taking the exam, you can answer the questions using the web interface or the CLI. Mostly those two, very unlikely you'll touch the API, actually. But it does involve skills that a typical open stack administrator would use on a daily basis. Um, the only caveat is there's no uh, expectations for you to like install or architect a full open stack environment. So that's kind of the definition of the open stack administrator. So um, how does this exam work? I'm going to let the people who have taken the exam talk about that. And actually, Ron actually was part of the committee in defining the items and writing the items. I'm going to let Ron talk about that a little bit. All right. So is this on? I guess it is on. All right. I'll just come up here and stand here so I can kind of point at, this, at the slides as I go, you know, with the magic invisible pointer. All right. So uh, one of the key concepts to this exam is it is 100% practicum meaning there's no true, false, multiple guest questions. It's all, you have to do it. They give you a scenario. You have to actually do OpenStack cloud administration. Uh, and one other cool thing about it is it can be remotely proctored, meaning you can take this exam at home. Okay? I would say at home in your underwear, but you probably don't want to do that because you have to have a webcam turned on because they watch you. So I suppose you could do it in your underwear if you really wanted to, but that might be kind of embarrassing. Okay? Uh, but the idea is you have to have, again, a computer at home, you have a webcam, you install a browser plug-in, and uh, one of the, the catches that we have found people who have taken it remotely is you can only have, if you have a multi-monitor system at home, you can only have one monitor active. So you'd have to, you have to deactivate the other monitors. For some reason, they don't like you to have multiple monitors because they think you might be cheating off of, of one of the monitors. I don't know. Okay. Um, another thing about the exam is it's based on the OpenStack Liberty release. So it is a couple of releases back. The idea is they're going to be revving the exam every, what was it, two years, I two think? Two years. Yeah, we're going to do every two years. So it's going to skip quite a few versions. But that's actually OK, because you're really only being tested on the core stuff that's in OpenStack that's really going to not change much, of anything, across the different revisions. Uh, the cost to take an exam is $300. As a matter of fact, if you actually go to the Foundation Lounge this week, you can get a $50 discount off of that. So if you pay here for the exam voucher, you can get the exam voucher for $250. So if any of you are thinking about taking the exam anytime in the near future, buy it here. It's going to save you $50. Bucks. There's also a student discount. 
Oh, you're right. There is a student discount as well. If you are a, a verified student, ooh, that's kind of ugly. Yeah, no, no. Uh, it's $150. Uh, that you don't have to purchase here. You just have to show your student ID when you or, or so some verification of student status, and you will get that discount when you, when you purchase uh, the, the voucher. Okay. Uh, we talked about it being re uh, revised every two years. Your certification is valid for three years. So if you take the exam and pass it today, three years from now it would time out. You'd have to take the exam again to renew your certification. Um, again, machine gradable we talked about. So you, you just you run the, you're, you're given a set of items that you need to do hands-on. You do the things. When you get done, it's actually tested not how you did it, they're testing if you successfully completed the thing they want you to do. So they're, they're testing the end result and it's machine gradable that way. You don't have a human picking through your check and to see what you did and, and whether it worked. Uh, the exam environment is currently deployed, it's on Ubuntu, but it deploys a vanilla OpenStack on top of that using OpenStack Ansible. Now this is actually something that, uh, there was just a press release that went out today from SUSE there's actually a, an update to this. One of the things at SUSE that we found as we've been teaching this is that the, ha, having an OpenStack exam, generic OpenStack is great, and we have no problem with that, but we found that people who are not familiar with Ubuntu, maybe they're you know, Red Hat people or maybe they're SUSE people, being forced to use a, an Ubuntu command line has caused some, some difficulty. People are like, oh, do I have to learn Ubuntu to be able to take this exam? And it, they, it keeps them from, you know, taking the exam because they're worried that they need to study up some other stuff. So what we've done is uh, we're piloting a program that's going to allow you to have uh, basically choose which command line environments you want uh, in the exam. So the OpenStack is going to be identical, but you can choose whether you want to do Ubuntu. And the first additional command line that's going to be available to you is OpenSUSE. So you'll have the chance of an OpenSUSE command line where you run the, the CLI commands. Uh, but you do have both the CLI and the dashboard available to you. So you can use either tool to accomplish most of the exam items. However, I will warn you, there are some exam items that you really can only do from the command line. So you need to be familiar with the command line uh, so that when you get to those, you can do those, uh, exam those items. So let me let, uh, some of, let Rob talk about that area. So where, which area was so particular sticky that you actually need the CLI? I knew you had some great <laughs> well, insights no, there, there. There are a couple. Like, um, like storage, so Swift is actually a really important component of this test. Um, I've played a lot of OpenStack systems that don't use it, but it is one of the core services. So understanding Swift and understanding some of the advanced capabilities of Swift becomes important. Um, and, and many of those capabilities, if you've used the user interface, if you've used the CLI, you'll know that the CLI gives you a lot more control over what objects, how objects interact in the Swift environment. So being able to interact with those objects, manipulate the objects in real time, is a core part of being able to administer, administer and manage the services that were deployed in that Swift environment. Knowing that is critical. If you don't know that, um, the help that's online may not give you the answers. Um, so really having, having gone through a lot of different exercises around things that you can do with Swift is one of those things I wish I knew when I took the test. <laughs> Yeah, so Mir Kura, we're all about Neutron. So Samir actually helped me write some of the Neutron questions. And right. about 13% of it is troubleshooting. So Samir, what did you want people to know well, when you helped me with thing, those questions? The, the test has a troubleshooting part that's mostly like a standard command line log wrapping uh, troubleshooting session. So it's not something that most of us ain't used to. It's a standard system administration stuff, so anybody who has any experience with command lines should be able to do it. But again, the stress on uh, knowing the command line, in theory, it's possible to pass the test just by clicking on horizon and doing stuff. But the time of the test, the time frame, you can't really make it in time waiting for clicking in every response. But you can. There are things you cannot do with Swift. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So Definitely. the exam is two and a half hours, so I remember that it, it was really aggressive. So you do have to have some strategies to maximize your time. Did you have some tips? Right. Yeah. So the strategy is like what you can do, what you're very confident of doing, do it fast in CLI. If you have something that you don't really, are not really confident, really leave it for later. Maybe try to do it in, in a web interface or Horizon or whatever. 
Just a quick note, when you mentioned, you know, you could probably pass the test by clicking everything in Horizon. That may be true, but you won't get 100%. Re realize that the passing score, I think, is what, 75, 73%, 78. something like 78%? We were somewhere in the 78. 70s. Okay. And so you can miss some items, but if you don't know the command line, if you have to rely on uh, Horizon, that means you would probably have to get 100% of everything you did in Horizon if, if you wanted to, to pass not ever touching the command line. We don't recommend it. That's kind of what we're saying here is get used to using the command line because you, uh, you will need it. Uh, another note about the troubleshooting bits. Um, some of the key things that I would point out to that is make sure you know what messages are going to show up in which log files and where those log files are. That's one of the, one of the key things that I would maybe suggest in the troubleshooting part because um, you'll, you'll probably have to do that. <laughs> Quick show of hands, how many people have operational experience, like really using OpenSAC? Okay. Uh, you, yeah, Samir, like where are those commands? So I have to memorize all the Neutron commands. So basically, where do I look for the var.log? Basically, .log? <laughs> basically all, both the troubleshooting and the rest of the test, it, it's very hard to pass without an actual hands-on experience, whether it's like self-training or uh, working with OpenStack. I don't think like just making an artificial test and trying to remember stuff is a good way to pass the test. You have to play with OpenStack. And you have to understand where things, where which service has logs and which files, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What to expect from OpenStack. And uh, Susan mentioned it's uh, based on uh, Liberty OpenStack, but it's not really OpenStack distribution specific test. It's pretty general OpenStack kind of experience. We, we touched a little bit on the time. The exam itself is 2.5 hours, but I know you guys were working like all the way through, right? And there was like no extra time. So are, any, are there any tips, you know, to yeah, how to figure out? Number one is uh, understand the command line. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't stress this enough because honestly, a lot of the things, you'll see a question in the, in the test maybe that you've never done. You, you haven't gone through every possible permutation of interaction with the system. If you know the command line or at least know the basic commands to utilize the command line, then the number one thing that you can do is use the command line help. The command line help, believe it or not, has nearly all the answers, with the exception of Swift. Read your Swift docs in advance. <laughs> but really, the help, is, the help is amazing, and the help really can get you through answering all the questions. Um, there are still some things that you'll, you'll just have to have experienced. Uh, and I would say, you know, understanding domains in Keystone is something that mm. if you've used older OpenStack environments and haven't used domains, get an idea of what they're like. I think that's the other key thing I would say. Uh, command line auto-completion is your friend in this case. It, it, it helped me answer some questions I wasn't sure about, for example. Uh, the next thing, there is a very clear, clearly written uh, COA tests uh, exam specification document online. Read it. It's, everything's there. What you need to know and what you don't need to know. That's my advice. So it was, uh, uh, Samir was referring to the weights. So there are weights um, for different portions of the exam. So the troubleshooting was worth 13%-ish. And don't think of those as actually time that you spend, though. It's the weight of the grading of the exam. And, and there was some uh, percentages associated with storage and, and things yeah, like so that. Yeah, so if you're wondering what we're talking about here, and I think we've got a we had a link to we'll it on a previous slide. Well. But if you just do a Google search of COA objectives, it's like one of the f first top five links that you get to. It does. It gives it lists you. Here's of all the different categories, here's all the objectives that you need to know how to do. And we keep hammering on Swift here. And, and, and the reason we are doing that, as he mentioned, is not as many people have experience with Swift as they do other things. And the command line is not as easily understandable. But if you look at the objectives that it tells you you need to know about Swift and you learn how to do all of those objectives, you'll be OK. It's just remember that it may not be as easy to find those, how to do those things from the command line help with Swift as it is with the other things. So um, we're going to switch gears and uh, uh, kind of talk about how to prepare for the COA, because it's actually not like a paper exam. So Ron, maybe you can talk about um, training or, or Yeah, well, so Samir said one thing. 
get hands-on experience. So I think both of you guys have said this. It really is true. You need to have hands-on experience. You can't just go read a book. You can't go read some man pages and go take this test and expect to pass. You have to have hands-on experience. Now, my job being a training architect for SUSE is to design training, good training. We've done that in SUSE. We have a great uh, COA prep course. Matter of fact, I'm teaching it upstairs right now. They're doing labs as I'm doing this. But, but that's one way that you can get the hands-on. But I would also suggest don't just go take a class and think you're ready to pass. Take the class and then practice, practice, practice. Because you need to be comfortable at the command line. I tell my students this when they, when they take the class. If you can do all of the hands-on exercises in my course comfortably without having to refer to the, the um, lab manual, then you can do about 90% of what is on the exam. Mm -hmm. And that other 10% is really, like you said, the experience that you just have to do it. And there's just some things that you just run into in day-to-day -day operating an OpenStack cloud. I think people really care about the answer to this question, actually. Hey, what are the hiring managers look for? You know, do I get more money if I take this exam? Do I get a promotion? I, I think people care about this. And by the way, how many folks are getting ready to take this exam anyway? Out Everybody there. Should be raising I, I didn't see anyone. <laughs> I mean, but anyway, um, Samir, you, so, you hire people yeah, all the time. The What's thing. going on? So uh, I run clouds. Uh, production clouds on a daily basis, and I have a team of people who is doing the same thing in multiple uh, geographies. And after I've seen this exam, and uh, after I took the exam and experienced it, I can confidently say that I wouldn't hire people who didn't pass it for, for running this kind of cloud. Because even though with a relatively lot of experience with OpenStack, there were some items there that really required me to take a look again into docs and remind myself how to do it. Uh, and this is really a good and comprehensive way to prove yourself that you are worthy of running production cloud. I, I would hire people who, who pass the exam. Yeah, I'll, I'll take another approach at it. Um, I also have hired people at the pa in the past looking at, at their capabilities in the OpenStack environment. And um, I've talked to people that have taken uh, other classes and taking the tests that were associated with those other vendors' classes. Um, and the worst thing is that when you ask somebody, said, okay, look, you took a three-day class on OpenStack, can you tell me one thing about it, given that you've also passed, apparently, a test? And they say, well, it was six months ago, and I really don't remember anything, right? I mean, that's, that's part of it, is that a lot of the tests that, that have been put together are basically, yeah, it's a, it's a checkbox at the end of the class to say, oh, yeah, I, I kind of remember a couple of the things from the last couple of days. Really, this test, because you're forced to actually show that you can, if not know it off the top of your head, which we don't expect, and I don't think anybody expects to, to be able to get through this test with that, you can discover it. And that really shows a lot of value in a, in a person's ability to actually be an effective resource uh, for a team, and especially one that understands OpenStack, because you understand then at least something about the networking space, something about the compute space, something about the storage services and space, and something about the identity space, right? The core things that you need to understand in an OpenStack environment. So from that perspective, it's amazingly powerful, and I don't think there's any question that if you have proven that you know this stuff, you should be able to get a better salary than just somebody who's coming in as a sysadmin who knows potentially one of the many silos in the in the service space, but doesn't understand the, the, the operations of a multivariant cloud like this. Let me open up for questions, because this session is really for you. You're here to figure out whether you want to take the exam, what do you get out of the exam, is there any promotion in store? Any questions out there at this point before we get back into some of these others? Yeah, go, go ahead, sir. Uh, sample questions. So actually, last session in Austin, we actually gave a sample for every uh, key area. Um, you can refer back to the video. So we gave an example of the neutron troubleshooting question, a compute question, and a storage question. But formally, though, um, the foundation is not offering any sample uh, exams or sample questions, because um, then you could probably study to the exam <laughs> and just pass it. The, the o, uh, COA uh, exam requirements is the name of the page. You can Google it. Yeah. And actually, it has a list of all possible. 
So questions. Let, let me make sure I, I may, uh, tell you what that is actually. So the COA is a composite of the task that an open SAC administrator is expected to do. And so it is not like an exam question, like you would study up like for SAT or something like that. But it is the things that an open SAC administrator would do, like something like set up tenants or um, how to sign a floating IP, you know, that kind of thing. Or the floating, I, I can't ping the floating IP, what's wrong with it, right? So that's that nature of the, what's called COA requirements. Yeah. I'm not aware of any like practice tests. That is probably what you're looking at. But again, using just the training material that we do, we're very much exercise and hands-on exercise oriented. So if you were to take, like, uh, say, the SUSE training, we give you all of the exercises, which are basically example, like we showed in the, the last uh, OpenStack Summit, give you examples of the things that you would need to know how to do. Yeah. Uh, to, to second that, uh, most of the classes that are out there, including the one that we've put together, is the same sort of thing. I'm not going to give you the exact answer to the question, but it's things like, you know, like, like Susan was saying and, and, and most of us have been saying, I need to create a user, right? Do you know how to do that? Uh, again, if you click through the UI, you can probably find where users might get created and you could probably create a user that way. If, on the other hand, you know the keystone command, or better yet, even the OpenStack command that you can use to create a user, um, or understand the OpenStack command and help to find the way to create a user, you can probably get that done much more efficiently. And it's not just a user, it's all of the other things that are listed in the requirements document, right? Same thing for virtual machines, same thing for storage, both Swift storage, and let's not forget volumes are an important part of storage in the OpenStack space as well. So all those things that are listed in that environment, if you think about the operations that you have to do around them and, you know, stand up a, a dev stack environment, worst case, Right? Start working through the process of, well, can I turn a virtual machine on? What does that require? Can I get a volume mounted on a virtual machine? Can I boot a, you know, th these are the sorts of things that you need to be able to do, whether it's through the UI or through the CLI. And again, I would recommend if you can do it all through the CLI, that much the better. But uh, that's, that's the approach that we can take. And that's really what we can offer from a class perspective. Because we aren't trying to teach you all the, oh, you know, don't forget this one little command in Swift, because otherwise you're going to fail the test, because that's not really true anyway. But what our classes are intending to try to do for you is give you the model for how to do these things, how to learn. That's why I say, from the perspective of, would I hire you? If you've been able to pass that test, I know that there's something that stumped you that you passed through, right? You got beyond. That's the real key to me. And another thing when we talk about hiring managers, being in the, the training and certification world for many, many years, we always joke that a certification exam basically is just telling people that I suck this, at least this much, or I don't suck at least this much, you know? And that's really what it is. You can't be expected to know everything. But like you said, you can be expected to find out how to do things. And that is more important than almost any other skill, is knowing how to find the right answer in a timely manner. But that still means you have to have enough experience so you know where to look. So each of these guys have this really bright red certificate with like a number on it. <laughs> I saw that. So what happened after you got the certificate? So yeah, uh, after I passed the, the, the test, the exam, uh, I used the opportunity to put the the little sticker you get in return to my LinkedIn profile. And it's like two hours later, emails started to arrive like crazy, recruiters. It's like, uh, there's this uh, position opening in this company that, and every like 30 minutes and following seven days spawn, I just started to receive even more and more of these recruiter emails. I mean, in our jobs, we usually receive every now and then these, these emails, but after this thing, I was so surprised. Like He got an like, offer from Goldman Sachs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't supposed to say that, right? Yeah, it's true. It's, it's, uh, a lot of companies are really uh, looking for this skill set. Yeah. It's uh, valuable. Robert. Okay. So, 
Well, we launched the exam in Austin, and so there were uh, test takers that took the exam in Austin, but I think we actually have some statistics for passing, actually. I do, and I'm trying to yeah. remember, I saw those statistics recently, and it's surprisingly low, like yeah. 50 to 60 percent, I think, yeah. are, are passing. I, I, again, I, I, um, that is a difficult one. Because, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, it, they announced in the the, uh, the keynote, it's been a little over 500 people yeah. have taken the exam yeah. since it was released in Austin. And if the pass rate is somewhere around, I think that's 60%, I mean, you yeah. can kind of do the math there. And so, I, again, I'm, I'm fudging numbers here because I don't remember the exact, yeah. but it, it really is, it's a challenging exam. Yeah. So what it is is the foundation has a lot of codes. So some of them, um, the codes may have been issued, but you can register for the code and then have a year to take it. So some people might have the codes already, but they may not have taken it. So I, my company, we have like 20 engineers that have codes, but obviously only a few have completed the exam. Yeah, we need to get them on that. Come on. They need an environment. My company <laughs> they need is the same way. I think we're all the same way. Got another question yeah. there? So the question is, are you asking about is, is the exam available globally or is it most popular in certain areas? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. So is it the accreditation widely accepted by hiring managers, I think is the question. Mm -hmm. Um, so since it's launched in, in April, and, and one thing about the Chinese market that I've been speaking with the OpenSec Foundation is that um, when the exam is not localized to the local language, so there are fewer test takers in certain countries that prefer to take the tests in, their na in the language of their choice. So I believe currently, it, it, I think only English, English is available. And so for China, I think, and, and, and this is the same as the user survey as well, until they localize the user survey to Chinese, the number of deployments uh, is artificially uh, low, actually, when there's actually a bigger number of uh, deployments that we saw today, right? We saw like China Mobile and, and uh, Bilin Group, and there's several really large Chinese deployment. It's just as artificially low, and it's not really truly reflecting uh, yeah, and, and, really they, and therefore they're, they're not going to recognize the exam as much either because they're just not seeing it as much, I would think. There's another way to think about that, too, and that is the, the, the class or the, the COA is actually accredited by the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation does a lot of other, other uh, tests that are accredited tests. Um, so there's a history there just from the other, other um, certifications that the Linux Foundation provides around Linux-based services, basically Linux Sys administration services. Um, this is effectively an extension to that, and that's one of the reasons that the OpenStack Foundation partnered with the Linux Foundation to provide this test. So that it's not just, you know, Cumulus Technologies saying, yeah, I've got a certification yeah. test. You want, you know, nobody's necessarily going to believe me because I'm a small company. But the Linux Foundation does actually have some weight behind it as a real accreditation partner for mm -hmm. the value of that, that examination. Yeah. Right. Uh, I just add to this uh, as an answer. I got uh, like at least two recruiter offers for well-famous Chinese companies as well. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Let's see. That might be, oh, so he, uh, one second while it loads up, but um, I, we have the link, oh, sorry about that. We have the link to the COA requirements in the slide, so feel free to refer to that. That's what were the weights of the exam and also the job tasks are on here. Um, so if there, do you guys have any questions for the panelists or for people in the item writing community? Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so the question is, um, this, is this an admin level and are there additional exams coming in the future? Yes. So yes, this is an admin level exam, so a level one exam, and uh, the current uh, position of the OpenStack Foundation is that they don't want to go up the stack. They, they're going to allow going up the stack out to the different vendors, yeah. which kind of makes a lot more sense, especially when it comes to deployment and architecting, because the different vendors are all going to recommend different ways of doing things. And which one is right? Well, yes is the answer. It really just depends. If they're your vendor, you need to do it the way that the, they suggest that you do it. Mm -hmm. So the, again, the current position is they're going to do the, the base level administrative certification and allow the additional exams to come from the vendor side of things. Yeah. Uh, were there any other questions in the audience? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Is it possible to only use the command line? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Up here? Oh, this right here. Yep. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of self-study. So I know you mentioned the dev staff, but is there any other sort of resources that I could use if I just wanted to self-study this on my own? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, need, you need an OpenStack environment, right? Yeah. I mean, the, key, the key is you need an OpenStack environment. Um, there are lots of ways of getting an OpenStack environment stood up on your laptop. I'm partial to the Cola model today. I, I, I think Cola is the most amazing way to deploy OpenStack ever built. Um, and I'm not a core developer or anything. I just really think that from an operations perspective, it is the answer. But that also means that you also need understanding of containers and some of these other services as well. Um, DevStack has some benefits in that it is a very easy way to get an OpenStack environment running. And again, the point in this test, and the, the point in the certification is not that I can turn an OpenStack system on, mm -hmm. it's that I can use that OpenStack system and actually get real work done with it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's, that's, why, that's why I suggested DevStack as a simple way of getting there. Um, but even DevStack still has problems because you have to go turn the Neutron services on in DevStack. Don't forget to do that. Um, again, I like Cola as my answer to that. Yeah. Uh, you need that. several hosts, actually, to understand how to troubleshoot things. If it's only like one host, then it's, although the exam itself is single host. You can, but you can still do it with a single host. I, I don't think that's Yeah, that's but you just need to Yeah, uh, yeah it really is kind of irrelevant how it's deployed. One as long as you've got the services deployed. I mean, for example, I mentioned that the exam environment is deployed using OpenStack Ansible, and, it, and it's deployed on a single system, so it's actually spread across a whole bunch of containers. Mm -hmm. But that's actually irrelevant. It doesn't yeah. matter that it's deployed that way because you're going to talk to the APIs mm -hmm. however it's deployed. So I guess the simple answer is get it deployed however you can, yeah. <laughs> and then use the requirements guide to go through and make sure you know how to do each one of those things, yeah. researching those things from the documentation. And again, I got to give props to the document, documentation team. The OpenStack documentation is some of the best technical yeah. documentation I've ever used, especially for an open source project. So, yeah. it, so it's really good information. Even though if it may lean slightly developer heavy, it still has good administrator yeah. and uh, user level documentation that can help you answer all this stuff. Did that answer the question? OK. Mm, OK. Oh, there's a In question back. back there. So the question is, do you have to dig into the configuration files for the services um, for this exam? And the answer is, you don't have to dig into the configuration files for configuration purposes, but if you can use the configuration files to help find where things are, such as where do the log files exist, that could be very useful. But again, it, there's no deployment or configuration of the underlying services required for the exam. It's the clouds deployed. You're going to use it from there up. In fact, the, the, container, the, the, the container aspect is one that, that may give some folks pause. Um, but the, 
the couple of, of test questions that I remember seeing, at least, that actually have you interact with containers in any way, those are documented very cleanly. This is what you need to do in order to get to the point where you should be able to do the right thing with the OpenStack system. Samir, so, do you want to comment on the neutron well, logs? Actually, but yeah, there before was a question I do that. about that. Um, and having been involved in the update of the exam where we're you know, being able to choose different command lines, there's been a slight re-architecture of the exam as well that's trying to even eliminate the whole containerisms that, mm. that are in there that uh, could potentially cause problems, even though they are well documented out. So it's, it, again, we're trying to do things to um, make it easier, because that one particular question you're talking about is the single most missed question on the test. And so that was one of the things as we were going back and doing some reviewing, trying to go, all right, this is not hard what we're asking him to do, but the way we're asking him to do it seems to be the problem. And so, again, we're trying to even abstract away from, you know, the containerness to make it even a little bit, you know, just more generic in nature. So, to reflect on, on, uh, on the questions of the exam about troubleshooting, they are really basic questions. Most you, you don't really need to fix anything in the deployment at all. You basically need to find very trivial issue and fix it by by a very simple way. It's kind of almost trivial, but uh, you need to be familiar where to look at and how to act. But it's basically it's basically most trivial, most simple troubleshooting there exists. But still, it's a troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any more questions? We only have two minutes and then we'll wrap. Oh, there's one last one here. Uh, it's more comment than a question. Okay, sure. Uh, it's a voice convention, the pre initiate option that I have selected. So if you don't know the environment, the uh, online uh, video environment uh, in advance, or if you don't know the whole event, you can make a trial and then you have a free retake option. Uh, correct. So yes, you have one free retake, um, and I think you can do that within 12 months as well. Yeah, and I want to just kind of hammer uh, bring that because that is a really good point. Uh, when I do my training, I, testing anxiety is huge among students. I mean, I think anybody who's done training, who's been to SAT classes and had to take exams, knows what I'm talking about here. And I try to hammer into my students that tests are actually learning experiences, not testing experiences. They help teach you what you don't know so you can go learn it. And the fact that the OpenStack exam has a built-in free retake, you should definitely be using that mentality. Study up, get as prepared as you can, go take the test, and find out what it is you, didn't, you don't know just in case you, you, you don't, don't pass it. Go learn it and then take it again and pass. So that is really a good thing. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, one last question from me. Is it possible to not know all the projects and still pass? Like, could I not know something? Or which project do I not, if I didn't know it, would I still be able to pass? Yes, maybe. It depends. I mean, honestly, it really is depends. I, I would not advocate you saying, well, I know everything but Swift, so I'm going to be fine. You can't count on that. Honestly, be familiar with everything that's on there to the best uh, uh, your best ability. Is it possible? Maybe, but I would not advocate that at all. <laughs> so only if you know everything else the perfect percent yeah. <laughs> then then you can do it. But knowing a little bit of everything is better than no concentrating on just one or two or three things. I guess that's the open stack idea anyway. Yeah, you should know them all. <laughs> uh, so so I'm, I'm only bringing this up because I knew somebody who actually never used, I want to say, Cinder, and they were able to pass the exam. <laughs> well, and that, again, I think that comes from being able to understand how to use tools like the command line client mm -hmm. help to discover yeah. the answers to the question that's being proposed. Correct. They were right? able to figure it out so, in the exam room. It's like, I know enough about the other tools to understand how this tool should yeah. work. Okay, I think we're out of time. So I want to thank the panelists, Robert Starmer, Cumulus, Samir from Mitokura, Ron Terry, Souza. And they might be around for you know, questions that you want to ask personally. So thank you very much for, for this.